Bryn Turnbull is the best-selling author of The Women Before Wallace, equipped with a Master's of Letters in Creative Writing from the University of St. Andrews, a Master's of Professional Communication from Ryerson University, and a Bachelor's Degree in English Literature from McGill University. Bryn focuses on finding stories of women lost within the cracks of the historical record, and she also lives in Toronto. Sarah Penner is the New York Times and internationally best-selling author of The Lost Apothecary, which will be translated into 40 languages worldwide and is set to be turned into a drama series by Fox. A graduate of the University of Kansas, Sarah spent 13 years in corporate finance and now writes full-time. She and her husband live in St. Petersburg, Florida with their miniature dash hound Zoe. To learn more, visit www.sarahpenner.com. Kate Quinn is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of historical fiction. A native of Southern California, she attended Boston University, where she earned bachelor's and master's degrees in classical voice. A lifelong history buff, she has written four novels in the Empress of Rome saga and two books set in the Italian Renaissance before turning to the 20th century with the Alice Network, The Huntress, and The Rose Code. All have been translated into multiple languages. She and her husband now live in California with two black rescue dogs. Born in India and raised in the U.S. since she was nine, Elka Joshi was, has a BA from Stanford University and an MFA from California College of Arts. Joshi's debut, debut novel, The Henna Artist, immediately became an NYT bestseller. A Reese Witherspoon book club pick was long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize and is in development as a TV series. Her second novel, The Secret Keeper of Jupor, will be followed by a third in 2023. And I'm now going to pass it off to these lovely ladies to get things started for us. All right. Well, thank you so much, Victoria. And thank you to RJ, Julia, and all the other uh, bookkeepers uh, or um, booksellers who are here sponsoring this. This is really amazing. And I wish that I had an hour with each of your gorgeous novels to talk to you about it, but uh, we're going to turn it over to the Q&A after about a half hour. Bryn, let's start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about what your novel is about? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so first of all, Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, thank you, Alka, Kate, and Sarah for all being here. This is just the most exciting evening ever. Um, so my, my book that just came out, my second book, it's called The Last Grand Duchess. It is about the fall of the Romanov uh, dynasty as told through the eyes of Olga, uh, the eldest daughter of Nicholas and Alexandra. So it follows, um, it, it looks at both before and after Nicholas's abdication, as well as Olga's personal life as she struggles to choose between love, duty, and family. Perfect. All right, Sarah, you're next. Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Bren, huge congratulations to you. I'm sure this is a very special week for you. And I know that Alka, Kate, and I all agree that we're very thrilled to help cheer you on. So I am the author of The Lost Apothecary, which has been out for almost a year now, and it actually comes out in paperback in 12 days, so not too far from now. And The Lost Apothecary is about a female apothecary poisoner who sells well-disguised poison to women seeking vengeance on the men who wronged them. And 200 years later in present day London, a woman finds a small mysterious vial in the River Thames and suspects that she has identified the culprit in the never solved apothecary murders. So a little bit of historical fiction, there's some magical realism, definitely mystery, sleuthing, thriller, suspense. It's got a little bit of something for everybody, everyone. Wow, okay, thank you so much. And Kate, you're up next. Tell oh, us well, a little bit about uh, the Diamond Eye. Uh, well, The Diamond Eye is coming out on March 29th. It is my next book after The Rose Code. And uh, well, I really find the best way to describe it is a Twitter discussion that came up not long ago, which asked writers to describe what is your book about and then what is it really about? So I can say The Diamond Eye is about, it's a World War II drama about the woman who became not only the most effective female sniper in World War II, but the most effective female sniper of all time. What is it really about? It is also really about, at the same time, how women internalize ungodly amounts of swallowed rage and ungodly amounts of uh, levels of perfectionism to achieve dazzling professional success at the cost of uh, crippling emotional problems underneath the surface. <laughs> so there you go. 
<laughs> and no one does that better than you, Kate. <laughs> Kate. I heard somebody describe it as the story of what happens uh, when men keep interrupting a woman who's trying to just write her goddamn thing. <laughs> <laughs> You're so right. Um, so, Bryn, you have followed up one fabulous historical novel, uh, The Woman Before Wallace, with another meticulously researched novel, The Last Grand Duchess. What inspired you to write historical fiction? You know, uh, historical fiction, it was always the genre that I gravitated towards as a reader. And, um, you know, it, it was always something that I, I wanted to get into, but it, I always kind of figured that it would be something that I'd do later in life. Um, that, you know, writing was not for me until I came across the story of Thelma Furness and what gravitated and what, what made me gravitate towards her story in particular was the notion that this was a woman who had been kind of, she'd been peripheral to one of the greatest events in the 20th century being the abdication and yet her story had never been told on its own merits. And I think with Olga Nikolaevna, eldest daughter of Nicholas and Alexandra, she's in a similar situation. You know, the, the, um, the fall of the Romanovs, it was arguably one of the biggest events in, in European history, if not world history. Mm -hmm. And yet we don't know Olga's story on its own merits. We know about her as one of four. We know about her as one of the Otma sisters, Olga, Tatiana, Maria, Anastasia. Or we know about her as this sheltered Grand Duchess whose parents had a relationship, had this mystical, uh, sinister relationship with Rasputin. And so for me, it was how do, you know, who's this young woman? How do we pull her story out of the limelight or out into the limelight? And when I started looking into it, I was amazed at what I found. You know, Olga was incredibly, she was politically aware. She was incredibly aware of what was happening in her country. She was a Red Cross nurse who assisted in amputations mm -hmm. of First World War soldiers. And, and so here's this dynamic young woman and, and I just felt so privileged to be able to tell her story, um, the story of her standing alone. Well, you know, I think this is interesting about historical fiction. How do we choose our subjects? Uh, Kate, tell us a little bit about how you chose the uh, female Russian sniper as a subject for your novel. Well, she came about when I was, you know, researching the Night Witches, which is the all-female Russian bomber pilot regiment that was flying against Hitler's Eastern Front in World War II, and which I was researching for my novel, The Huntress. And I was suddenly coming across all these other Russian women war heroes. And that was really something new to me because as I found out, the Soviet Union was the only allied nation to put women actively in combat, not as partisan fighters, not as spies. And I'm not saying that that's not real fighting. It certainly was, but officially in combat as part of their army, as part of their air force. So suddenly I was running across all of these women when, you know, when you're looking at other allied women, you're finding tales of the home front or, you know, spy stories. But for Russian women, I was suddenly finding women who were tank drivers, women who were bomber pilots, who were fighter pilots, and women who were snipers. And the most famous of those was Lyudmila Pavlichenko. And she earned the nickname Lady Death, which I thought was just like the most hair-raising thing I'd ever found in my <laughs> life. And but the thing that really, you know, fascinated me even more was the fact of how relatable she was because she wrote her memoirs later in life. And when I delved into those, I realized you have a certain image of a woman sniper. You think it's going to be some cold, icy Russian blonde, you know, with her ice colored eyes, you know, pity at all, you know, that kind of thing. And instead I found this woman who was a single mother, a graduate student, you know, an aspiring historian, which is definitely something I can relate to. And, you know, this woman who whose only ambition in life was, you know, to finish her dissertation and provide a life for her young son, and who had this deeply relatable nerdiness about her. She was a bookworm. She talked books. She, you know, she had all of these deeply relatable things about her, despite the fact that she had this fearsome reputation. So yeah. that really was what drew me to her was not only the fact that she, you know, had a tally of 309 and got to be best friends with Eleanor Roosevelt when she came to the United States on a Goodwill tour, but the fact that she was also a woman that we can imagine being friends with, you know, a woman we can imagine knowing and liking. Mm -hmm. And you know, that really is one of the wonderful things about historical fiction is that you can look at people in the past 
who you might think live such different lives from us. And then you actually realize the commonalities, the things that draw us together, like the fact that this woman, you know, is trying to be a good mom and trying to be a good student and trying to, you know, figure out a way to provide a life for herself and her family and is still dealing with an ex-husband who just yeah. will not leave her alone. And all of these things are things that we can relate to. And that's what I love to find is in historical fiction is when you find someone who is, yeah. who you want to write about because they gobsmack you, but yeah. then they, they become personal to you and they become someone that you feel like you could know and who you could right. run into any day. You know, what's interesting is you and Bran are both writing about Russia um, <laughs> and, and, at, at, and at the same time, but such different books. Uh, you know, and I, I think this is that kind of spontaneous combustion that happens sometimes. What fascinated both of you about Russia? I'll let Bryn go to that one first, because you're talking Imperial Russia and I'm talking Soviet Russia. And oh my goodness, different times, definitely. Completely two sides of a coin, absolutely. Um, you know, for, for me, the thing that really fascinated me about Imperial Russia, it's just, it's, it's such a snapshot of a moment in time that first of all, is never gonna come back, but also just the opulence of it. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the grandeur of Imperial Russia. It's something that you see and, and it's it's like a dream almost when you when you look at it and and when you just kind of picture what was happening in the lives of of these people who not only were living at the very top of the system, but also who were living at the very bottom of it. Yeah. And and so, you know, there's a very logical and very inevitable thoroughfare between the the women in my book and the women in, in Kate's book who are, you know, you know, where, where you see how that, uh, you see how that progression goes. Once, where once you've had this opulence, what's going to follow, uh, you know, what's going to rise from the ashes of that. Right. Well, and it really comes down to one of the Russian emblems is the phoenix, you know, rising from the ashes. And the thing that I find fascinating about Russia is that, you know, it's such a huge country that there, it has one of everything, you know, it is so massive that you can't say that there is, one part of Russia that is the definitive Russian experience. You know, Lyudmila Pavlachenko was Ukrainian, which was Russia, part of Russia at the time. It is not part of Russia anymore, but Ukraine has its own history. It's bound up with the Soviet Union in some very ugly ways, unfortunately. But the thing I find, if you can find anything about the Soviet Union or about Russia, any that you could call a national character is that there is a sense of mysticism that pervades through the history because things are slow to change in a country that large, which means yeah. that things, there's folklore that persisted into the 20th century, you know, which is still in, in some ways alive in a way that in smaller countries got stamped out much faster by the industrial right. revolution. And it also means too that there's also a thing where when you have a country that large, you're not necessarily defeating only the people if you're invading it, you have to defeat the country itself and you can't, it's too large, it's too right. cold, it is right. too much its own thing. And really the thing that amazed me about World War II is that how there was this callback where Napoleon almost happened yesterday in the national consciousness of Russia, where there was still this thing where everyone sort of looked at Hitler and it's like, you know, we're just going to let the winter and the land <laughs> defeat you because that worked for Napoleon. It's going to work for you. And it, and it, did. And it wasn't working. <laughs> Um, now, speaking of mysticism, Sarah, you're writing about a female apothecary of poisons, and I do not ever want to eat at your house. So, <laughs> so don't it's, touch the eggs. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's funny, as soon as Kate said the word mysticism, I immediately, you know, think of kind of what inspired me to write historical fiction. And like Bren said, I began as a reader of historical fiction. I think many of us writers do. And one of the earliest authors that I read and fell in love with uh, is Philippa Gregory. And she's most well known for her stories about the Boleyn sisters. And there was always something so enchanting and kind of fairy tale magical to me about her stories. And What's what something that's different about the lost apothecary versus the other books we've been talking about is there are no real life characters in the lost apothecary. All of the characters are fictional, but what brought me to the story was very much a sense of place. And that first sense of place that I had in my mind was this little apothecary shop at the very back of a hidden alleyway in central London, kind of you know, hidden between buildings, behind a, a, a trick door. 
And so that was really what propelled me into the story. Now it helps that I mentioned, I think someone mentioned earlier on my bio that I used to work in finance and I had the opportunity to travel to London many times. And every time I went, I was just awestruck by, you know, these pubs that are 300 years old or these brick alleyways that look like they've been, I went and saw like Ro all these Roman, um, you know, remains. And it's just amazing to me that you can literally step into history in so many of these beautiful places throughout the world. So I very much, my entry point into writing historical fiction was not necessarily a real life figure, but instead the sense of place and evoking that mm -hmm. for readers in a way that other historical fiction authors have done for me. Especially right. humbling as an American when you go to another country, you know, like Europe, like <laughs> India, which is so much older than ours. And you think like there are manhole covers here that are older than my entire nation. Yes. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Many, many times I studied in Scotland and I would pass buildings every day and be like, okay, this is older than Canada. Yeah. <laughs> I know, you know, I am loath to tell people that my house that I live in now is 110 years old because to Europeans, it makes no difference at all. They're like, oh, that's a new house. Yep. <laughs> um, okay, so um, what do each of you hope? And, you know, I know that all of us historical fiction authors, really what we're writing about are women who got lost in history. We want to bring their stories to light. And so um, what do each of you hope uh, your readers are going to take away from your novels, The Last Grand Duchess, The Diamond Eye, The Lost Apothecary. By the way, all fabulous names. <laughs> yeah, no. Ren, you want to get all, it started? Absolutely. Yeah, we, we've all we've all got good names. They're all like, <laughs> and at Secret Keeper of Drive Core, Hannah Art, same thing, just like <laughs> meaty names. They're so good. Um, so in terms of what I want people to take away from The Last Grand Duchess, the thing that I always found every time I've read about the Romanovs, whether fiction or nonfiction, it there so many times they're either viewed as tyrants or as victims. Um, you know, th there's always a lens through which they're portrayed, and and to me, the truth of them lies somewhere in the middle. But the truth of the Romanovs lies most fundamentally in the fact that they were a family, and and the family bond that they have through all of the. Um, you know, the diaries that they kept, the journals that they wrote, the, you know, the accounts of their contemporaries, retainers at court. The, the thing that for me always struck home was this is a family, first and foremost. And if you take away the trappings of the office, if you take away the, you know, splendid palaces and the gilt and the glamour and the diamonds, you're left with this wonderful, this wonderfully close knit family unit and, and a family with virtues and flaws, just like any other. And so for me, that was the most important thing was it, I'm, I'm not writing about the martyrdom of the Romanov yeah. necessarily. I'm not writing about the fact that they, uh, well, you know, I am, I'm writing about all of these aspects of them. The fact that, you know, they were complicit in, you know, in, in this corrupt yeah. system, but they were a family and, and they were a family that loved and played pranks on each other and yeah. took silly photos. And, and that to me was just so important and so special. What would have happened if their hemophiliac son had died? Mm. Well, that's the big mystery about the Romanovs because so after Catherine the Great, her son who hated Catherine changed mm -hmm. the laws of succession. And so women were not allowed to take on the rule of Russia. And that was the big, that was a big issue for the Romanovs or for the last Romanovs rather because they had these four intelligent, dynamic, wonderful daughters, and none of them were eligible for the line of succession. So mm -hmm. at one point, um, when it was clear that, that Alexei's hemophilia was, was a serious problem and that he might not reach adulthood, Nicholas looked into having the law change so that Olga would be able to succeed if Alexei died. And, and that kind of didn't go anywhere because the law had been so mm -hmm. kind of just cemented into Russian law that, that they couldn't actually change it. So what would have happened? Who knows? Maybe they would have gotten around to it. Maybe Olga would have ended up taking over, but uh, yeah, it's one of those what if moments of history. Wow. I would like to see it all. Now you write the alternative history where Olga becomes Tsarina and heads off the Russian revolution. Yay. With her wives and- exactly. 
wise and well considered as uh, rulership after her father, who was let's face it, a little bit of a little bit of a moron in some ways, the way he handled things. <laughs> yeah, he was a he was a soft dog, as 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 people have told me about my dachshund. He's a soft <laughs> dog. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wanted um, the Romanov rulers to be a lot stronger. It was the mother who was so strong and she was driving me nuts as I was reading this because I just wanted her to push her out of the way <laughs> and say, do you realize that this entire empire is going down because of you and what you, uh, what you are imagining? Um, so Sarah, what would you like to tell us about what you hope for your readers? What are, what are they gonna take away from The Lost Apothecary? Yeah, so The Lost Apothecary, for those of you who haven't read it, it's dual timeline. So there it, we, we see a woman in present day London, and then we see two women. Um, well, one is an adolescent girl and then a, an aging grown woman um, in the historical timeline. And what was so not only challenging, but also really fulfilling as I wrote both timelines um, and kind of thought about the struggles that all three of these characters were going through is that no matter where we're from, when we live, what we're experiencing, we, especially as women, are really not that different from one another. We all want the same things. We want validation. We want safety. We want the ability to make our own money or have our own things that we're proud of. We want the ability to be free and independent and that was something that I was able to explore in writing this story and very much something that I hope women and men who read the book kind of take away that, you know, even though we see 200 years separating these characters, mm -hmm. um, there are very similar struggles and just core intrinsic desires that we all have. And the people who come 200 years from now, when we're all long gone, they're going to be the same. It's the human experience. Yeah. And the other piece that I would like readers to take away, particularly when we look at the adolescent girl, her name is Eliza, and then Nella, the apothecary, they both live in 1791. They could not be more different. Eliza is very naive and spunky. Nella is very vengeful and, and aggrieved. And yet they kind of, by the end of the story, have taught each other so much and saved each other in some ways. And I think it's an opportunity for us all to kind of look at the people in our own life, especially maybe people that we think, oh, I'd have nothing in common with them. I, I can't relate to them. Why would I reach out to them? There may actually be more similarities there than you might think. And I think whether the person has a different life experience, they're older, they're younger, what have you, we can all learn a little bit uh, from, from everybody. So those are a couple of the things that I hope readers take away. Yeah, and I think in the, the Diamond Eye, same thing with Mila. I think Mila is really uh, teaching us that you should go for what you want to do and you can make it happen and uh, you can do it and still be a loving person with to you know to your family you you, you can be uh, a sniper and still have a, a heart yes yeah, so that was the thing that really was the challenge about this book was that you know how is it that i can make a woman like this who was, you know, a Soviet woman who, you know, she was a hard believer in communism and in, you know, Stalin, even though we know these things did not <laughs> fundamentally bring good to their country, but she was a believer in these things. This was her time. And she also was someone, you know, who frankly um, has a longer tally list than anybody except maybe Sarah's apothecary. Mm -hmm. And she has all of these things. How can I make her understandable and, and you know, sympathetic to mm -hmm. a modern day audience? Mm -hmm. And it really is looking, again, as, you know, Sarah said, for these commonalities between experiences, you know, that we want similar things and that, you know, we want the, and the, we have things that we want, things that we aim for. And the thing I really ended up finding for Mila is that, you know, it's the fact that women tend to be very hard on themselves. Yeah. And we hold ourselves to immensely high standards. It's, you know, most of the women I know are like this to some degree. So the thing that I really ended up trying to, you know, hopefully that readers will pull away from Mila's story is the idea that, you know, you can go for what you want, but it will not kill you if you fail. You can fail. You can pick yourself up, back up and try again. You can do this. And, it, you know, there is not the idea that like, well, if you fail once, then that's it. Because that's something that she has to learn in the course of this book. 
And I yeah. would say too, just in far as historical fiction in general, I think it's so valuable. And it's something I like for anyone to reading historical fiction, not just mine, but Bren's and Alka's and Sarah's is that historical fiction is a wonderful way to examine the issues of the present, but through the lens of the past. Because what we're often doing is, you know, if you come up to someone, any almost any reader and say, I want to have a discussion about fill in hot button issue here. Most people are going to be like, that sounds like it's going to be a discussion with a lot of yelling. And I think I have something else I'd rather do <laughs> uh, because, you know, we're nervous about these discussions, but if we can wrap these hot button issues, the current things that are, you know, roiling and dividing us today in story, it is a way that we can gently back people into a quarter a little bit and ask them to consider an issue in the context of the of a fictional world, in the context of the past where it's a little less charged than it is when we're looking at it in a modern day headline. Yeah. And that's why I think it's, you know, historical fiction and sci-fi are sort of sister genres. The sci-fi looks at the issues of the present through a lens of the future. And <laughs> historical fiction uses the past, but both rely on world building. And both are very much, we're, we're talking about the issues of today. It's just that we're using stories of the past to do it. That's a really good uh, analogy. I, I like that distinction between the science fiction and between historical fiction. Um, I also think that historical fiction um, allows us to remember the history a little bit more because, you know, if you think about it, history books are very dry. And I don't know about you, but I was never interested in the battles and the rulers. And, you know, I was just going, you know, put me to sleep. But if I read historical fiction and it has women in it and I'm interested in what the women were doing at that time, I will remember that history a lot more, like as I will remember all of your fabulous books. So today we are talking about, Kate was just talking, Diamond, The Diamond Eye, uh, Sarah's The Lost Apothecary, and Bran, hold up your fabulous book because I only have the, um, oh. the, the version right before it. <laughs> yes, fabulous, Last Grand Duchess, The Last Grand Duchess, fabulous books. So um, lightning round, each of us, please, uh, please tell us what is something your readers don't know about you. What is like some, some kind of a surprise? Sarah, you kick it off. Oh, of course I'm going first. Um, okay, something that a lot of people don't know about me is for basically half my life, I have loved to cook. I cook most nights of the week, like a from scratch dinner. I love it. Okay, Bryn. Uh, I am a, uh, I, I'm a licensed bartender. I refinish furniture in my spare time and I have got an encyclopedic knowledge for song lyrics. Like oh my God. If, you, if you're ever at karaoke, I'm your girl. <laughs> you know, you, you will remember song lyrics. I like think if, you, if you've ever heard the song before, you will remember them. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Once and it's like, boom, it's in the vault. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, Kate, what is surprising about you? Uh, well, before I decided to become a novelist, I trained as an opera singer. So I still sing along with opera in the car. I sing along with musicals as well. And I absolutely can get through every single one of those fast flows on Angelica Schuyler's Satisfied if I'm singing along in the car. Wow. Oh my okay, God. You'll have heard your karaoke. She's the one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, you guys are amazing. And let's see, what about me? Um, so I, um, I um, um, okay, so I always thought I would be an artist. I always thought I would draw. I thought I would be drawing New Yorker cartoons. And maybe now, now that I'm a full-time author, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a chance. So I'm going to send in my New Yorker cartoons finally to the New Yorker. Uh, and they're all about my dogs because dogs are funny and they teach us so much. So that's about me. Um, you know, now we're going to hopefully open it up to Q&A. And I wanted to invite Victoria back from RJ Julia. And I think that she is going to moderate uh, the question and answer. So you guys, if you have questions, please put them in the chat function. And, uh, and you know, Victoria will find them and read them off. Um, yes. <laughs> we have a lot of questions coming in. So we will jump right in. Let's see. Let's start with, so these are questions for everyone. How do you pick a story idea from your running list of stories? And is it difficult to narrow it down and focus on one idea if you have multiple people or topics you want to write about? I can Brand, start off first. 
Um, sure, I'll, I'll start. For me, it's the character comes and sits in my head and, and literally will sit there and go, I'm not leaving. Wow. Start writing. I'm not leaving until you, until you write the book. Uh, and then for the competing ideas, yeah, it's absolutely impossible because at some point another <laughs> character comes into the other side of your brain and goes, yeah, but in this one, you get to kill somebody. <laughs> you go, oh. Yeah. <laughs> and have you ever noticed that character always turns up when like you're in the editing trenches and you're really hating your book? Like that's when the new character comes up and dangles the shiny idea in front of you. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> I wish that would happen. I like that idea. Sarah, does that happen to you? So I, I wish I was like so many authors that had like this Google document with all of these great ideas and it's just a matter of time to get to it. The, my second book, my sophomore novel, which has not yet been announced, the idea came to me when I was having a glass of wine in like a period of 30 minutes at the full, like a fully formed story. And I wrote it down as quickly as I could. And then I drafted it in like 11 weeks and it was not on a Google document. It was not on a list. So I, I, I have to say for me, it's just kind of like that magic. I mean, in a way the lost apothecary was the same. It, it wasn't queued up for, for writing someday. It just sort of came to me. So and I don't know what my third book will be. And I'll just have to wait until that one decides to pop in. So I'm a little different in that way, I guess. I tend to um, have it where you know, I do keep a file. I'd literally just call the plot possibilities file where I stash, you know, little two sentence ideas if they occur to me in the shower or while I'm driving or, you know, I stash links in there. If I read a link of something, inter an interesting <laughs> article that, you know, oh, that might make an interesting book someday. And then generally speaking, I mean, something quite often will be grabbing me and say, please, please write me next. Please write me next. But, you know, like whenever you're trying to uh, not just be a writer for because of the joy of it, but also because you want to pay the light bill, there's the question of what's going to sell. And so then it becomes a little bit of a discussion with editors and agents and so forth, where you're trying to find that sort of like Venn diagram overlay between like, what is it that you feel passionate enough to write and what is it that uh, your editor thinks you, they can sell and will be a nice follow-up to whatever you've already got. So I don't, that's sort of always trying to find that, you know, overlap. And, you know, of course these things change because trends in what people are reading change all the time. Yeah. So, you know, it took me 10 years to write The Henna Artist and, and people keep asking me, so during that time, didn't you want to write about something else? You just kept writing on the same, you know what? It never once occurred to me, write something else. It just, it's, it's like it grabbed a hold of me and it would not let go. And then when I, when The Henna Artist went off to the printers, then one of the characters, Malik said, oh my God, I cannot let this go. You've got to write my story. And then I started writing book number two. And then I realized that book number two doesn't have anything about the third central character from The Henna Artist. And then I have to write Right? book number three it's almost like they are propelling me to write the next novel yeah okay so next question in doing your research how often do you find first person accounts or diaries of women living in the historical time and struggling against the social norms of that time you certainly can find them I mean like it's they're there and actually I was very pleased with the diamond eye because for the very first time I had um, something to work off of where the, the woman, not only had she really lived, but she wrote her memoirs. And so I actually had her own story in her own words. Although even then it's like people think that's gotta make it super easy, right? But it does it because you never know you know, people's, you know, people's diaries, the things that they write, they're writing a little bit for posterity, maybe. And they're also writing, you know, you're writing your own experiences, but people can be a little blind about their own experiences. So you're not, even when you have words from the horse's mouth, as it were, you cannot entirely take those words at face value. And that's the fun part about interpretation. It's because when you have to look at, all right, this is what she's saying is what happened, but I have a different account here and I have a different account here. And what do I really think is going on? And so it's always going to be an act of interpretation, which is why fiction, you know, even when you're writing off of real historical documents, it's never just a matter of transcribing the past. It's, it's never a matter of transcribing the past. And it's also the, the things that we take for granted in our day and age, back, you know, 50, 75, 100, 20, 200 years ago, the same people writing took the same things for granted. So, you know, for example, at what point did, were you able to unplug a phone from one room and plug it into another room in order to take the same call? Things like that. You don't always know. And it's not going to necessarily be written about because that's just something that, that a, a, an individual would take for granted. 
Um, I also think so much of history, you know, so many of the written accounts of history are written by men. It's written by the victors and the victors for, you know, millennia have been men. And so, and so the women's stories, I think historical fiction is such an important part to play in bringing those women's stories to life. Um, you know, we're so lucky to be able to work in this genre where we can bring these stories back and, and really, you know, dig into those experiences of women. Yeah. You know, when they first told me that my books were going to go into the historical fiction genre uh, at the publishers, I didn't even know what that was. I didn't even know that was a genre. And so I looked it up and I go, oh, I've been reading all of those books in that genre. Now I get it. Now, now I see what that's all about. And I agree with you, Bryn. I think it is so important for women's history to, uh, to read historical fiction. Yeah. Yeah, I think the importance of firsthand accounts in researching historical fiction cannot be overstated. And that was actually what I immediately reached for is this firsthand account um, of an apothecary. Now, with all of the, the talk about not losing women in history, it almost like proves this point because this is a, a man, a male apothecary. But it's his firsthand account, of course, you know, transcribed and edited and what have you. Um, of all of the patients that he saw, and he was late 18th century, all of the patients, what remedy he was dispensing them, what he charged, what his own debts were. There are some really beautiful and poignant moments in here when he saw a solar eclipse, or I'm sorry, a lunar eclipse, um, tragedies that, you know, his patients died, all kinds of really just honest, raw details. I wish that I had found this written by a woman apothecary, but um, this was the best I could do. So I think when you can find those firsthand accounts, it's just, it's the most authentic glimpse you're going to get because you're not getting someone else's interpretation, like Kate said. Yep. Okay. What are your favorite historical TV shows or movies with strong woman characters like in your books? Oof. Sarah, start us off. Oh gosh, <laughs> I, I do not watch a lot of TV. Um, you know, I watched the first season of Outlander and liked it for, for reasons that probably a lot of us, especially the women on, on this call who are tuning in, liked it for. Um, I think Outlander was, was really entertaining. Um, but I don't watch a whole lot of TV, so I'm probably not the best person to answer pop culture questions. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll go next. Uh, and I'm only going to say this because um, when the producers bought the option for the henna artist, they said this could be like an Indian Downton Abbey. So I'm going to say Downton Abbey because there were some really strong female characters like the first daughter. Uh, I think she was an amazing uh, prickly. She was a little prickly. She wasn't, you know, she knew her mind. She knew what she wanted. And I really like that about her. So I'll say Downton Abbey. I'm very fond of Peaky Blinders, which mm -hmm. is a show about, you know, gangsters put in, Bir in Birmingham post-World War I, but for all that it is a show about gangsters, the stars, you know, the three brothers and the leads, but it is a show with a huge number of very strong-willed, strong-minded women characters, and these are women who absolutely pass the Bechdel test. They absolutely are not there just to look pretty and, you know, prop up the male characters. They all have their own agendas, and so that's one that I have really enjoyed and that really stands up, actually, to re-watching. Uh, go Aunt Polly. Oh, yes. Oh, Aunt Polly. Uh, you know, I, so my answer is a little bit out, out of left field because technically it's not historical fiction. Well, actually, technically it is historical fiction, but it's so in the past. The BBC recently did a re an adaptation of War and Peace. I think it was in 2016, 2017, mm -hmm. and it was spectacular. Oh. Um, you know, I, I watched it, I've, I've watched it probably five or six times over just because it's so beautifully done. Um, and, you know, I watched The Great as well, Huzzah. Um, while, writing, as, uh, while writing The Last Grand Duchess. I wouldn't say that was particularly historically accurate, but oh my God, it was a rollicking good time. <laughs> All right. Love historical fiction. Reason because after reading, I go into the web to research to see what is factual. Do you all go down a rabbit hole like this? And if so, how do you get out? It's almost Your impossible. Agent? When your agent or your editor or your friends say, no, you don't need to know this yet. And they, you have, it hasn't occurred to you that your deadline is approaching. That's how you get out. Um, 
I have actually started to try to, I've tried to, I mean, we all go down the rabbit hole and we love the rabbit hole or we wouldn't be in historical fiction, but it is very easy sometimes to do this thing where you spend five hours researching something that ends up being two lines in one paragraph and that yes. paragraph gets cut in yes. your second draft. <laughs> And that can be heartbreaking because it's like, damn it, you put all this time in. So I have started, I, I am not, I am not ashamed sometimes of doing the thing of like putting in parentheses, insert historically accurate banquet menu here and keep going because maybe later I won't actually, I'll realize I don't need that scene with the banquet. And then I didn't waste the time for it. And, um, or I'll do a verbal end run sometimes, like actually when I advised a friend who was starting to go down a rabbit hole and be like, I need maps of New York City in, 18, in 1912, because how can I be sure that my heroine can see this building right. that, the, from where she's standing? And that's where I said, no, you are not going down the rabbit hole. Finding maps, what you're going to do is say she looked in the direction of that building. And that <laughs> gets you around the whole need to find the maps. Now just keep going. And she said, you know that you're right, that will do it. So I actually am a big believer in go down that rabbit hole when you need to, but do not do research that you don't have to do because that is the thing that will kill your time faster than anything when you are a history nerd. But I think we are all such nerds, you know, yeah. I, we write historical fiction. It means we are interested in history and facts and things like that. So I think we love rabbit holes. We love going down those rabbit holes. Oh, uh, for, for I think for the henna artist, I went down this rabbit hole looking at erotic pocket watches from the Victorian era. And I, <laughs> man, I really got into the whole erotic pocket watch thing. And I was thinking, oh, I might want to get one of these for myself. <laughs> and I'm like, Alka, stop. You are writing a novel. This is not for you. <laughs> and then your Google search history looks really interesting. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> You're getting some weird ads. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see targeted ad Amazon advertising though for erotic pocket watches of the 19th. I mean, really, yeah, that's that's gonna be something. <laughs> it's it's so funny. I find I when I'm researching, I'll I'll kind of like emerge from the research rabbit hole for you know sustenance at some point, like. I'll get a phone call from a friend being like, we literally haven't seen you in two weeks. And I'll come out with this sort of glazed glassy look on my face and they'll be like, you did it again. You did it again. Get out, get out, get out. Pen. Here's a pen. Here's a pen. Here's a piece of paper. Start writing. Don't look anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, because, because you've gone into your head because you're, I've you're into, starting... well, because I've gone into the rabbit hole. I've gone into the research rabbit hole and I'm deep diving on something. Okay. And they like pull me out from the computer and I'm kind of like, no, but I still, but someone's going to care about that two sentence word like thing. And yeah, <laughs> they're like, you got to give it up at some point. <laughs> Just keep <laughs> writing pages, pages. Yeah. I love, I love Kate's bracket. Uh, that's what I use. I, I do kind of the overarching research in the very beginning, draft the story, use the brackets, uh, and then fill in later. Um, I think that that's a really good technique. Oh. All right. I do it. I do it as I go along. You guys, I can't, I can't either. Thank I, you. Oh, good. Brand. <laughs> Glad to hear you both, but you know, it's hard to, it's hard, it's hard sometimes to know what you're going to need and what you won't. So you just go down that hole. <laughs> oh, I know I'll, I'll dig in. <laughs> All right, so kind of a follow-up question to that is what do you use most for your research? Is it like internet, libraries, specific documents? Well, I think since the pandemic has been upon us, I tend to use a lot of internet uh, because we couldn't go to libraries. Uh, so many of our books have been published during pandemics. And so, um, yeah, I tend to use the internet a lot. Um, but even in the internet, you can go into JSTOR, you can go into all kinds of research documents uh, at universities. And so it feels like you're actually there, but now the internet makes it a lot easier. I don't have to get in my car and go somewhere. Do you guys feel the same way? Well, yeah, with, with the lost apothecary, there were so many digitized documents. Um, pharmacopoeia, that's actually a word mentioned in the book. Pharmacopoeia is kind of like this old encyclopedia of drugs and remedies. And there are so many amazing resources that have been digitized by these wonderful archivists and librarians all over the world where you can go in and, and see these 16th century, 17th century pharmacopias and the types of things that a real life apothecary would have been dispensing. So the, that couldn't be done without the internet. I mean, you could 
fly to London, go to the British Library, get in the queue, get the book, sit down with it and spend weeks with it. Or you can just bookmark it on your internet and use it for free. And I, don't do that. Don't go there because you guys, you're going to have to have a COVID test before. You're going to have COVID test after. You're going to have a COVID test before you start coming back to the United States. Don't do it. I am so sick of COVID tests right now with all the traveling. <laughs> Gosh, I, you know, I was supposed to go to Russia when I was writing The Last Grand Duchess in 20, late 2018. I was all set to go. I was talking to the Canadian embassy about getting there on an arts visa. I'm all raring to go booking my tickets. And then a little something happened on the way to the drugstore called COVID. And uh, yeah, so that put paid to all of the plans, everything. Like I was, I was supposed to go to the Winter Palace and to St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. Um, None of that happened. Uh, but thank goodness for the internet and particularly for YouTube, for this book, yeah. YouTube is my savior, because so many people go to, they went to Russia, they took videos of the inside of the Winter Palace of, you know, the Alexander Palace and posted their travel logs online. And I honestly could not have written this book without people posting their travel logs on YouTube. So anybody who's done that, thank you. From the bottom of my heart because that is so much of where the last grand duchess's scenery comes from <laughs> i found that you know, again a lot of it you know was you know it has been so good online because it's not even just like being able to google things there's so much more online now it's not just with digitization of letters and things like that yeah i found all of eleanor roosevelt's my day columns online and you know just you could search them by name <laughs> Are those yours, Kate? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would echo the keyword searching is amazing. You know, the, the uh, well, Kate, I see you're back on, so I'll, I'll let you keep going. <laughs> yeah, they, they, you think they know what an Instacart delivery is by now. Um, <laughs> but it, the thing I really found, it's things like, you know, all those people who upload vintage menus onto it's oh, onto yeah. like Pinterest. My yeah. God, you people yeah. saved my life. Now I finally can figure out how much does a cup of coffee cost in a diner in DC and yes. 50. Or just things like um, Google Maps is wonderful because I had a whole chase through Washington DC to plan and I wasn't able to go to DC and walk it. So I am literally like plotting on Google Maps. It's like, how far is the Russian embassy from Rock Creek Park? Right. And then I'm finding guidebooks to try to tell me about parks, you know, so because I have a sniper duel to plan in one, which does lead to some very funny exclamations from my study when I'm saying things like, because you, you, I like, again, you find those travel bloggers who are talking about their times in parks and so forth and traveling and, you know, visiting. And it, there I am snarling, you know, like, I don't want to hear about how you've reconnected to your sense of spirituality by your hike through Rock Creek Park and your visit to Boulder Bridge. Can you please just tell me if this creek is deep enough to sink a body in? <laughs> Which is, again, the kind of thing that, you know, uh, does lead to some very interesting Google search results. And in addition to menus, one thing that uh, I always look at are Vogue magazines and, uh, yes, you know, apps. magazine, good housekeeping, anything from a certain era. So in book number three, I'm writing about Paris in 1974. So I had to look at fashions in 1974. What are the women in Paris wearing? Because it's going to be different from what they're wearing in the United States in 1974. Mm -hmm. And that was so much fun. I went down that rabbit hole and thought, I need to buy that coat. <laughs> A good rabbit hole that's a good one <laughs> I actually got a um I got a reference book of 1930s women's dresses when I was writing the woman before Wallace and I'm telling you I'm going to take this book to a tailor one day to a seamstress and say I want page 84 I want page 22 and I want page 203 go <laughs> <laughs> all right so we're gonna make this the final question, just because this is one of RJ Julia's favorite questions to ask, and we just had a viewer ask it. So what are the books that you currently have on your nightstand or books you can't wait to start? It's a um, tough one. You guys can have a second to think about it. <laughs> That's a um, tough I can, one. I can start. I have, I am so looking forward to, um, I have Piper Higuli's, um, 
a novel about Anne Lowe called By Her Own Design. Anne Lowe was the black, uh, the black fashion designer who designed Jackie Kennedy's wedding dress to JFK. I That's have a cover. Yes, and then I have it's a lovely cover. And then I have um, Mademoiselle Revolution about a biracial woman who ends up embroiled in the French Revolution. I am looking for the I'm looking for the name on that because I I get so many ARCs in, <laughs> and then I am looking at also Kate Forsythe's new book and Christina McMorris's new book, and I am drowning in beautiful ARCs right now. So I really can't. I'm just absolutely in heaven. <laughs> Something that's on my desk right now is The Prophet's Wife ooh, by Libby Grant, also known as Libby Hawker. Um, this is an, Kate called it an ARC. I call it an ARC. doesn't really matter, but it's an advanced reader copy. And this is one of the perks of being an author is we get all of these beautiful advanced copies to read. Um, so this is on my list. And then I'm also reading through NetGalley, I got um, Lucy Foley's next book, The Paris Apartment. It's kind of like my uh, end of day when I just want to lay in bed and, and kind of lose myself. So I'm reading that, really liking that as well. Yeah. Let's see. I, I have Walter Mosley's uh, uh, Blood Grove right now. Uh, I'm going to be interviewing him soon. So I'm excited about reading that. And um, I read this wonderful book called A Net for Small Fishes by Lucy Jago. That's also historical fiction. And that's all about... Um, uh, uh, 18th century England. So uh, that was really a, a lovely book to read. Um, and I've got, right now I just started an arc of Madeline Martin's The Librarian Spy. Uh, she wrote The Last Bookshop in London, which I was absolutely enchanted by. So I am so excited for this book. I'm about 20 pages in and I'm loving it so far. And the other one that I've got coming up in the pipeline is Kristen Beck's The Winter Orphans. Uh, that's also an arc right now, but um, I loved her first book, Courage My Love, about the Italian resistance in the Second World War, and this one promises to be an absolute cracker as well. Wow. All right. Well, I want to... Oh, and let's not forget the other three books that I read in order to prepare for this. The Last Grand Duchess, <laughs> Kate Quinn's uh, The Diamond Eye, and of course, Sarah Penner's The Lost Apothecary. <laughs> All so beautiful books. I want to thank everyone so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Bren, Alka, Kate, Sarah. It was such a lovely discussion between you all. Of course, do not forget to purchase a copy of The Last Grand Duchess, as well as The Lost Apothecary, The Diamond Eye, and The Secret Keeper of Junipur. I want to thank you again for all being here, and I hope you have a great rest of your night. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.